what are three things that a relationship must survive or it won't survive? Mm, different attachment styles. So different okay. emotional responses to triggers. Right. That's one. Um, different sexual appetites or mm. um, like needs in the bedroom so, and being able to communicate that to each other. So by survive, um, surviving the differences, surviving the contrast. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And number three. Um, a willingness to be comfortable in expansion and contraction. Ooh. So mine was distance. So if your partner goes away for two weeks and there's going to be conflict, um, a distrust, jealousy, any of that, um, I don't think the relationship is sustainable. And also emotional distance because sometimes we need some distance. Contraction. Yeah. yeah. So that actually um, is, is uh, overlaps. Mm -hmm. My number two was... Uh, fights, which is obvious, right? Um, not just the big fights that we get into, but just, you know, the, the bickering, the day-to-day. -day. If you can't, if your relationship can't survive fights um, where you both come out of it, you know, without anger and resentment, I don't think it's going to have legs. Or if and, you don't fight at all, which or that you don't in fight itself all, is right. its so own. That's, avoid. That, that's a giant fight with, your, with yourself, basically. And then the third one um, was your own growth. So if the relationship can't survive in each individual's growth, right? That's um, a good one. Then people are going to start outgrowing each other. There's going to be drift. So those were my three. And this falls under the category of our final chapter in our new book, It's Not Me, It's You, um, sustaining your relationship. How do you keep your relationship uh, going? You know, how do you create legs? How do you give it wings? Yeah, I think all those are really good yeah all right I so us. we're gonna go to questions um go ahead question number one um okay so the first question i pulled out of the ones that you all submitted is is inconsistent communication a red flag when dating someone new especially when they were consistent the first two months yeah so uh you want to go first or do you want me to go ahead uh, for me uh the big red flag is something different happened, right? So mm, if they were consistent, shift. yeah, if they were consistent the first two months and then something changed where now they're, they're inconsistent, especially with communication, I smell drift. I smell something happening in the other person for that behavior to change. And so um, for me, that's what I would explore is why. Now, if they were inconsistent the entire time, mm -hmm. that may be different, right? That may be um, lack of tools. That may be, you know, fear of intimacy or whatever. But if they were very communicated, communicative communicative mm -hmm. with you at first <laughs> um, early on and then suddenly they are you know um, less responsive they're they're um, the time that they it takes for them to text you back is longer uh, if they're you know not talking as much not being as vulnerable it, to me it feels like they're kind of closing up what about you I'm going to say yes to all of that, and we all have a really bad habit of formulating a story in our minds before we actually bring it to the person right. who is the other lead character in the story. So if I were to say to this person, yes, that's a red flag, I've essentially given you the go-ahead to create an entire story arc in your mind and then say, and this is how I'm going to react to it, and now I'm going to say to him, we're done, and I'm going to say X, and he's going to say Y, rather than just me saying, maybe maybe it's a red flag, maybe you should discuss it with them. Yeah. Maybe you should say to them what consistent communication feels like, looks like to you, and let them know that for the first couple months they were tracking with what felt comfortable for you and now they're not, and ask them to explain why. Now I'm not saying that, that what you said couldn't potentially be the reality. Sure, of course that could be the reality, but it could also be other things. Like maybe they're in a really high stressful situation at their job right now and they didn't even realize that it was affecting their communication with you. Maybe there's family strain and you've only been dating this person for two months so like why would they bring you in on that information right like there's just so many other options um that you won't know unless you ask them look into that one that's the master not that these people are not i was gonna say i'm like i actually think these ones are the master <laughs> well that's well because the lives disappear 
That's the, true. Instagram doesn't allow you to save them anymore. Okay, next question. The next one. How often does one of you, us, want to run and what do you do about it? Mm. I try to run three times a week. It's really hard for me. It's still something that I'm learning to do. <laughs> um, I think the runner in this relationship is you. Truth. Okay, so you want to answer that? <laughs> I'm the runner, you're the grabber. Would you say yes to that? Yeah, I... Um, so I guess the visual would be I, I hold on to her leg and uh, as she's trying to run. <laughs> oh, that's so depressing <laughs> as a visual. Um, as you can tell, I lean more avoidant and he leans more anxious. anxious yeah. Um, I don't know if I can give a number on how often one of us, i.e. me, wants to run, but I think this is a good question because I think it's really common in relationships and I think that people assume that it's a red flag, to use that term again, um, and that it's like a bad thing and it means something sometimes more than it actually does, which is just, um, I am activated right now. I'm feeling overwhelmed and flooded by whatever this emotional situation or conversation or intimacy or vulnerability is. Um, and so I need to address the specific thing rather than saying, oh, it means something about the larger relationship. Well, real quick, why do people <clears throat> run, you think? I know there are many reasons, but... All those, I mean, all those things I just gave, for sure. Okay. Right. And then so something that... Um, Bringing it back to us, something that I do would activate you fleeing. What would what would some of the things um, be like? Me not doing the dishes? No, no. Um, oh, I can give a really recent example. So I was just talking to my therapist this week, actually, about how um, and this actually is similar to another question that was asked. I was really proud of myself because I was writing. Um, we're in deadline for this book. And I was like really in a zone and you came in from the coffee shop or something and there was a part of the book that you wanted to discuss that you were in and it was like, you know, let's say 50 pages ahead of where I was. Um, and you came in and you're like, okay, so this part, da da da, like let's talk about this. And I, without even really thinking about it or even like getting, having any kind of feeling about it, just like very clearly and calmly looked up and I said, um, you know, is is it really important? Like, is it hot? Do we need to talk about it right now? Or Basically, it, you're not it, there yet. Can it wait for an hour? Because yeah. I'm in a zone right now and I'm like really into what right. I'm doing. Um, and if I transition to what you want to talk about, I'm going to have a hard time coming back. That might seem small or silly, but I think for me, it's a big deal because I struggle to communicate when I need space mm. and when I need um, so you, I was you going to too respect fast. my space. Yeah, so right? I, was, I, was, I was pushing you. Yeah, well, you, I, I think a lot of times in, in our dynamic, sometimes it's like you come in um, and there's like a subtle expectation and you might not put this on me, but I take this on myself because I'm codependent, um, that I need to drop what I'm doing and adjust to what you want me to do in order to make sure you feel okay and things stay good and calm in the relationship. That if in a moment that you come in and expect me to adjust to you in any way, if I say no, even if it's loving and kind, I'm somehow rocking the boat or I'm being demanding or I'm being bitchy or whatever the story is I have in my mind. And so for me, that trickles into this idea of wanting to run because a lot of times I won't set that boundary. I won't ask for what I need. I won't be clear about like I need physical space or emotional space. I'll keep pushing it down, pushing it down, pushing it down until the point of being like, holy shit, I need absolute alone time. Like get the hell away from me, yeah. you know, um, rather than just doing what I did when you came in about the writing, which was like very in the moment, you were fine with it. And then I felt like, okay, good. I have that space. Does that make sense? Yes. And um, I think the old me would have tried to override you, would have been like, well, no, let's just talk about it now and try to uh, convince you to do it now. And then if, you, then if you did it, you would then have anger and resentment and you would feel very grabbed. Um, something else just recently happened, and it might be a little TMI, but you wanted to meditate before um, we had a little afternoon delight. And so that was also you um, putting a speed bump, right? That was also something that where you're like, wait, um, I'm, I just got done teaching. I need transition. I need transition. Um, I, and so give me eight minutes to breathe. Uh, and then we can rip our clothes off. <laughs> We've done this a couple times, actually. The meditation? Sidebar, for any of you listening who are curious about uh, an intimacy technique that I have found as somebody who does tend to be more avoidant and also more highly sensitive when it comes to nervous system stimulation. Yes, and by, by the way, um, I appreciate that because I've never done that. Mm. So, so this is, so meditating before um, being intimate is uh, something that I've never done before. 
We're having technical difficulties. No, it's okay. With Ignore Instagram. It. Um, yeah. So recently, it's been a couple times that this has happened where I've specifically said, "Let's sit down and meditate together. Lay down yeah. on the bed and meditate together for five minutes, ten minutes, whatever." Yeah. Um, before doing anything, even if it's not actually sex, even if yeah. it's just about going into the next thing. I'm already um, standing there naked, by the way. And <laughs> I have felt very connected to you in that moment in a way that sometimes I have a hard time getting to. Um, and I'm starting to notice that the co-regulation that happens when two mm. people just sit side by side or lay side by side and just breathe together and have a similar like focal point, in this case meditation, is, yeah, is it, like really, for me, it makes me feel very connected. Yeah, it creates a runway. Like way more connected sometimes than us actually having the sex, for example. Now, I'm not saying that's not connecting, yeah, yeah, yeah. but sometimes that eight minutes for me can fill my love tank up more than the physical act of sex. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's almost like, okay, let's run off this cliff, um, but let's hold hands and run together before we jump. And be in sync. Right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's probably what the second or third time we did that. And uh, I, I like it. It also calms me down. Um, I think it's a good thing. And I... I uh, I, I think also the old me would have res, uh, would have resisted it. Like, mm. what's the point? What do you mean meditate? We only have twenty minutes. Well, you know, whatever it is, right? Because we have a child and we have you know all these things. So um, now time is a is a is an issue, and then there's pressure there, and then of course. So um, yeah. So anyway, a tip: uh, meditate uh, together. Together, not like in separate rooms. Um, and I, I do believe in this. Um, um, uh, Co is I don't know if the word is co-regulation, um, and you know your hearts don't have to like sync up like um, synchronized swimmers. Swimmers, <laughs> but um, and you don't have to sit there lying in bed holding hands, but just being next to each other and just kind of feeling each other's energy and syncing up in a way, uh, and then you go um, into uh, being intimate. I think is. To me, that's new. And I think so, it should yeah, be a practice. It actually, definitely works. I think it could be a really powerful practice. Also, if you work from home and 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 you know you're just running around and all of this stuff, it, it works really well. Okay, next question. Um, why are relationships so hard? Oh, this is a great question, and also probably take uh, about four hours to answer. I know, never let's, never ending. Actually, <laughs> let's put, I put things in a shot glass, Vanessa, a wine glass. So I guess I'll go first. Um, I'll tell you why relationships are so hard. Because it's not just you and it's not just the other person who have different stories, different upbringings, all of that stuff, all the different layers, different love languages, different attachment styles and all that. But it's the combination of both of you, which I think creates a whole nother thing. And I think it's something that people don't don't talk about, right? Like, um, I'm I'm a certain way. I'm my own person when I'm by myself. Vanessa is her own person. And then when we come together, um, we're building something different. And that thing that we're building is its own living, breathing thing. Um, and I know it sounds kind of weird, but I feel like uh, when you are in dance with someone, the uh, the fifty percent you, the fifty percent the other person, and then what you guys are. Uh, doing together is is going to require um, obviously compromise, looking inward, watching you know for toes, communication, you know all of that stuff. And so that's not what we're used to, and that's why I think relationships are are difficult. So I would say that what you just said was very much in a wine glass, and I'm actually going to be the one to give it in a shot okay, glass. Okay, let's flip it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> that felt like a wine glass to me. Yeah. Um, my shot glass, glass response would be that relationships are mirrors, and so they're hard. Dang it! You're right. I know. Man, relationships are hard because yeah, they hold up a mirror. They mirror back to us our own shit. Oh, that's good. They activate us. That's they good. simulate our old patterns, our wounding from childhood, all of our yeah. unlearned things that we don't look at. Shit, right? Yeah. And so, you either accept the challenge. Or you don't and a lot of people spend a lifetime not wanting to accept yeah. the challenge well, running running yeah um, and while that in itself it's like oh well that's the hard part being alone I actually disagree I think the hard part is actually looking in the mirror 
and really getting in there and digging in and owning your shit and all of the activations and all the shit that comes up when you're in relationship. By the way, not just romantic relationship, right? Well, friendships, friends, family, family, right. everything. Um, what does it look like to actually accept? Because uh, this is really interesting because a lot of people say they're uh, quote unquote doing the work or working on themselves and they're reading a lot of self-help books or taking a lot of content, but they're not really um, holding up a mirror looking at themselves, right? Looking inward. And so what would it look like in a relationship to um, to accept, to when you say accept, do you mean acknowledge? Not No, because I think that's only 50%. So um, when you say the hardest thing about a relationship is that it holds up a mirror, mm -hmm. okay, what's the action? Once uh, you've looked in the mirror? Yeah, because um, a lot of people look in the mirror and they um, there's defensiveness. Yeah, there's There's, like, there's pushing away. There's pointed fingers. And so uh, what's hard in a relationship isn't just the looking in the mirror. It's the actual what, what people are going to do about it. This is where the road forks. So you're either going to run and, and possibly find someone else because this is too hard and you don't want to look at yourself. Or you actually do look at yourself and then um, start processing, start looking inward, start sitting with um, all that. To me, that's what's hard, mm -hmm. right? Which is a lot of therapy and, and all of that. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna quote, I mean, it's kind of like an AA term, but my friend Danae says this all the time, like in every situation, there's an opportunity for you to say, what's my 100%? In every situation. I don't care if you're even the victim in a situation. In every situation, there's an opportunity to say, what's my 100%? Yeah. What can I own unequivocally, right? Even in a situation where you're the quote unquote victim, there is still something to be owned. And that might be something like, what are my old patterns that attracted me to this person in the first place? Um, you know, uh, was me not speaking up um, or communicating what got me into this relationship mess or whatever it is, right? This isn't to like victim blame, but it's to say, bottom line, as a therapist, I would say in every situation, relational situation, what is your 100% to own? Yeah, and That's your, the hard part. And your 100% is always only going to be 50% because every relationship has two people. Yeah. So, I no, mean, I no, get no. the math. I get the math. But even each person has their own 100% to, to, to claim in a situation. Well, yeah, saying? my point is even if you are putting in 100%, you're only 50% of a relationship. So you can't save the relationship oh, yeah, or yeah. do the other person's work for them. So it takes two people going in, yeah. um, you know, 100 to make that. To make that 100. 100. Okay. <laughs> Um, you want one more? No, I was going to say, so for, for, uh, cause I'm trying to always bring it back to us, which is, you know, our pattern for the book. Um, so Vanessa and I, we're both horn signs. I'm an Aries. Vanessa is a Taurus. And so, uh, we're both stubborn. Um, we're both, uh, we, we're, we both have opinions, strong opinions. Right. And so, uh, when Vanessa holds up a mirror, it's hard for some reason it's harder for me because we are similar in ways to really look at it it's easier for me to defend or <laughs> want to crack the mirror or run um so so that to me feels like human nature but yeah no i mean out of everyone i've like uh, been d d dated or other relationships and so that is actually um a good thing because there's a there's more of a stretch there, so if it's harder for you, you're you're probably gonna get more um, growth from from that. So me leaning into this and our differences and the stuff that we talk about, um, I think it, it is what's gonna grow me a lot more. So oh, yeah. than if I was someone with someone um, where there weren't two two. Oh, I don't want to mess up the you know the horns. Yeah, you I know? mean I. If we're really taking this turn, I would venture to say that the, um, for those of you who are listening who are astrology nerds like I am, the difference in our moon signs is actually more important, I think, in this specific conversation than well, just the fact that we both have sun signs that have horns. Yeah, and I, I don't know a lot about astrology, but just in general. Um, I think we both tend to be a little bit more alpha. Yeah. I think we both tend to be that's the it, that's ones the thing. that okay, so want forget to the moon be and the stars. It's and the alpha thing. To. It's, it's more of the alpha thing. I think we both tend to have a, um, a tendency to let our ego Take yeah. the wheel. Yeah. I'm an Aries. I, I, I have a huge ego. Yeah. And I'm a Taurus and I know everything <laughs> as Taurus do. So Which is not a good, uh, it's not a good mindset if you want to yeah. build a relationship. Okay. One final question. Um, by the way, thank you guys for all hanging out up, 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 um, 
in the front row, and then also up in the uh, the bleachers the back rafters. there, <laughs> the rafters. This is a way to do it. We're killing three birds right now. Everyone's doing it this way. It's not like we're smart. I know people have also gotten upset in the past. Like, I don't like that your podcast. I already heard it on IGTV, and it's like, well, people have said that. Yeah, I've seen people comment that on when we did this before. Uh, we have a child. We have um, only so much time. Gotta during milk the day. everything we can out of this yeah. time that we, we um, this limited time. <laughs> we need to take a butter knife to our shit and just. Um, okay, so I actually kind of feel like this. We kind of already covered this, but um, we'll see. So. How did you discuss needs for alone time early in the relationship or how to how to have your own life outside the relationship? So something about alone yes, time slash um, having your own life. This is really important. I think uh, one of the balls that we drop, uh, many drop, is that when we're single, we're out every day building our life, right? We're connecting to ourselves. We're working out. We're trying to get fit. We're pursuing our dreams, all that stuff. And then we find someone that we want to uh, invest in, and then we start dropping those balls. And then suddenly, you know, we go to the gym less. We, you know, spend less time with our friends. And, you know, and it makes sense because we want to be with, um, you know, our person. But over time, you can actually lose your life. You can and actually, lose that person. And then, and then ultimately lose that person, yeah. So I think having a life when you're in a relationship is more important than having a life um, when you're not in one. So when you're in a relationship, you have to continue to pedal that life bike. I think it's. I think everything you're saying is accurate. I think that the issue that we have as a society is that we are bred to be codependent. Um, we are raised in a codependent society that teaches us that relationships should look like I disappear when I marry you because now I become Mrs. John Kim, for example. Mm, or yeah. like, like we should be spending all of our time together and I, I'm right. selfish for saying, no, I do yoga three times a week and I'm not losing that, right? Like right. that's important to me. Um, and so there, in so many ways, we are just bred to become this very unhealthy codependent dynamic in relationships that it's kind of like an act of resistance actually to stand up and say, it's really important to me that I keep a strong sense of self even when I become partnered. Or have my own friends or... Right. Yeah. And so um, I don't... I say that to say it's not easy for a lot of people. Um, I think for some people who find it easy, I would actually even question if it's more of like a hyper-independence. So like they swing the opposite direction and they're like, you know, I'm going to do this whether you like it or not, which is also not healthy. So everything you said I'm tracking with. I also think sometimes it's good to like do things together that are not just like having Netflix and chill time, right? Like yeah. one of the things we love to do the most is like work out together, right? Like sweat together, that's important to us. So it could also be a way of like, how do you how do you integrate things like that into your dynamic and also say like yoga is my thing or whatever and like I'm gonna keep doing it three times a week because it's important that I feel, I don't know, like myself. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Vanessa got a brand new tattoo that she doesn't have to show. It's really cool. It's beautiful, and um, I'm 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 seeing this because I'm seeing my tattoo uh, uh, because we're filming this, and I have a quick story as we end. This was supposed to uh, be a symbol that represents your true north, and I thought it was kind of cool, simple, and I got it tattooed. Uh, and if you're listening, it's just like a little. It looked like it looks kind of like an arrow. Uh, in a circle. In a circle. And then I came to the gym one day and someone said, hey, you got a USB port tattooed on your forearm. And ever since then, it's ruined it. And now all I see is a USB port. I don't agree. I don't think it looks like a USB port at all. Piss me off. <laughs> you want to show your tattoo? No, because okay. it's still in the healing phase and it's a little yucky right yeah. now. All right. Well, uh, hey. I did every- post it on my Instagram yesterday. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Uh, everyone, thanks for hanging out and uh, keep the questions coming. We will do our best to answer them. And uh, our new book, we're really excited about our new book coming out. It's called It's Not Me, It's You. And, uh, yeah, we're just trying to create a dialogue to help people. And hopefully um, we're coming with you guys, not at you guys. Uh, We're not trying to um, be uh, the example relationship because we're not. We have struggles. And um, in our book, we're very transparent in, you know, all of our shortcomings and what we've struggled with. That's it. All right. You nailed it. Be well.